Luke chapter 10, we see Jesus as excited as at any time in his life on earth. Luke chapter 10, verse 21 is one of my favorite verses in the whole of the New Testament. Because what's happened in Luke chapter 10, Jesus has upped the ante. He had his 12 guys around him that he was investing in and mentoring and releasing. Then suddenly he gets 72 and appoints them to go out and visit the villages. And he's like, you've seen the way I do it when I visit a village. Basically, I lay hands on the sick and they get well. I preach the gospel and people get saved. I cast out demons. You've seen what I do. Now you lot, ordinary, unschooled people, go out in twos, do the same thing. And they go out. And they come back with this report, Jesus, even the demons flee when we mention your name. We've seen healings. We've seen incredible deliverance. And Jesus is so excited. And he says this, Luke chapter 10, verse 21. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned, and you revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, For this was your great pleasure. Literally, that phrase, Jesus, full of joy, is rejoices. In the original language, it means jumping and leaping and spinning like a top. How much would you give to have been there when you to see Jesus jumping around? It's gonna work, Father. Through these bunch of jokers, we're gonna change the world. Uh, My spirit in them, they're gonna do what I've done. Father, it's a great plan. (laughs) Them, (laughs) those 72 and a couple of billion, 2,000 years later, full of the spirit, can turn the world upside down. That's us people. We can bring joy to Jesus' heart. It says in the Bible, there's joy in heaven over one sinner's rescued life. Let's be those people who bring joy to the Lord. So there's dancing and jumping and people spinning like a top over what happens through the people in coastal church as they go out in his name, the way he sent us by the power of the Spirit. I love that this is Pentecost Sunday. And how exciting that the Alpha Holy Spirit Day is happening now. And they're probably watching last night's talk anytime now. Come on, let's pray. God, send your spirit on those people. Pour out your spirit. Save them and fill them and send us out. Send them out as you sent out the 72. So Jesus is pretty excited. And it's okay to get excited with him when we see his kingdom advancing and him doing the things that only he can do. Then guess what? As always seemed to be the case in Jesus' life, the miserable, joy-crushing, peace-robbing religious posse turn up. You know, they were busily trying to quench what God wanted to do. God wanted to release the poor and the broken. And this cheeky expert in the law, that's like expert in the Old Testament law, you know, religious leader, comes to test Jesus, the Bible says. The cheeky rat. (laughs) The created one testing the creator. I mean, sometimes religious people can be so weird and think they're cleverer than God. And this guy certainly did. So on one occasion, a religious expert, expert in the law, stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he was asking that question, I think, because he almost certainly heard that Jesus had been making these outrageous claims. Jesus had been saying, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life. Nobody gets to the Father but through me, i.e. nobody can inherit eternal life except through me. What an outrageous thing to say. And it wound this religious leader up so much, like, come on, Jesus, let's catch him out. Maybe we could even arrest him and kill him right now for blasphemy. If he says, right now, as I'm stood here, expert in the law, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And yet Jesus did what he always did when he was confronted by people like this. He answered a question with a question. He said, what's written in the law, clever boy? I put that bit in. (laughs) What's written in the boy? What's written in the law? And the guy answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do this and you'll live. 
That's exactly what the expert in the law didn't want. He wanted a big religious argument. He wanted a theological arm wrestle. Let's show who's the clever one. Let's show who understands the Old Testament law. Come on, Jesus. Let's see what was spoken in the law and the prophets. And let's see how that works out and see you're the one who could make us inherit eternal life. And then it says this, but wanting to justify himself, he asked, who's my neighbor? And you know, we're all like that sometimes, aren't we? It's a horrible thing. I know I've got it in me, wanting to justify myself, pushing myself forward, wanting to make myself look good, justifying ourselves. It's a horrible thing. God can justify us. God can look after our reputation. We don't need to push ourselves forward and jostle. We need to walk the way of love. What's a Christian? Christian is someone who loves God with all the heart and loves other people. Nobody's ever done it perfectly. Nobody's ever done it well enough to get themselves to heaven. But if somebody could, they would go to heaven. But we can't, so we're stuffed. We need someone who can clothe us in his righteousness. Someone who can make us fit for heaven. We know someone. Tell me what his beautiful name is again. Our Jesus can make us right. So when we stand before God, he doesn't see what we used to be. He sees Jesus, the only one who ever loved God with heart, soul, mind, strength, the only one who ever truly loved his neighbor as himself, right to the end. Christian faith is all about love, actually. And I was struck, you know, as I was preparing this talk, how good at loving people I am. Especially, you know, the, the thing that really upset Jesus about the expert in the law was he loved his narrow little group of friends, the religious Jews, anybody who wasn't in the in club, anybody who wasn't like him, You know, sinners and rebels and con men and prostitutes. Basically, Jesus' best friends. The people he parted with, the people he spent time with. He hated those people. He hated the Samaritans, those half-breeds who watered down the Jewish religion. But his narrow little group of people he considered to be neighbours. And I was struck, you know, how good am I? Am I at loving people not like me? You know, I struggle to support Gently charismatic evangelicals who support Man United and are straight. You know, they're my kind of people. You know, they're, they're, the, they're people I might want as my friends. But we're not meant to be those people. We're meant to be people who love everybody. Everybody's on. Who's your neighbor? Everybody's your neighbor. And this is where the religious leader was so lacking love for Jesus and love for people. And so Jesus told him a little story, which must have been so annoying. It's the little story. Whenever he was confronted by these wise and learned religious people, he just told stories. I love the fact that Jesus was a storyteller. The big stars in Jesus' day were storytellers because people used to travel for miles to hear the greatest storytellers. We did have pop stars and movie stars, but storytellers could fill the great amphitheaters. And Jesus' stories, you could always take them on two levels. You know, you could enjoy the story. There you go. Been there, done that. Interesting. Well done, Jesus. Or you could allow the deep, eternal meaning to sink in and you're never the same again. Same, same today at church. Same watching online. We can just go through the motions. We're here. Yeah, we agree with that. Nice story, nice word, loud mouth mancunion at the front, off we go. Or we can allow the Holy Spirit to sink into our heart and change us forever. Do it, Lord. As we listen to this story, Jesus said a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers, said Jesus? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. These are real world characters and real places 
that Jesus' audience could relate to. Whether, the, whether it really happened, we don't know or not. But it could so easily have happened on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, 17-mile road, very dangerous place. There were bandits waiting to jump you and beat you and leave you half dead and naked with none of your possessions. Read verse 30. A man was going down that road and when he was attacked by robbers, he was stripped, he was beaten and he was left half for dead. And coming along the road, there's the guy half dead by the side of the road, naked and beaten up, nearly dead. And the first person is a priest, a priest who's probably coming from doing his two-week shift in the temple because priests used to do a two-week shift, then some time at home, then back to the temple to do their religious duties. And he was probably pretty proud of himself. He probably felt like, I've served God well. And he wants to get home to his wife and kids. Last thing he needs is some messed up, broken person on the side of the road interrupting his schedule. Also, as a priest, if that guy was dead, because he was half dead, he probably looked dead. If he touched that man, because of all the rules and rituals, because of the world he lived in, which is do, 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 do. I've got to do all this stuff to please God. If he touched the dead body, the rules posse said he had to go through all this rigmarole of purification. Last thing he needed was that hassle today. So he walked by on the other side, ignored the man. Along came next the Levite. Another religious man who should have known better, but he walked by on the other side. How often do we do that? Maybe not people bleeding and dying, but people crying out for the good news of Jesus. Our colleagues, our neighbors, even our friends, the dying inside, the lost without Christ. Spiritually, they're bleeding and dying on the side of the road and we walk by, we get on with our life. But along came a Samaritan, a, a hated Samaritan. And he showed the religious people what love looked like. Love looks like people interrupting our schedule. Love looks like costly, costing people dearly. Pastor Dave told me a beautiful story about a man who he led to Christ and a man who cut across his schedule and he ended up working in his laundromat for a period of time as a pastor, just to get a lot. I mean, who, which pastor needs to do that? You don't need that aggravation, do you? But out of love for this man, it cost him dearly. His most, you know, his biggest commodity is time and his heart he gave to this man. And then he was saved and his whole family was blessed. And it's just a beautiful story. How much the lost, broken, hurting people cost us because love costs. How much time are we willing to give to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Jesus was the ultimate example of this, wasn't he, of course? People constantly cut across his plans. He was like the man on a mission, going to Jerusalem. I must go to Jerusalem and suffer and die, for that is why I came. He's on this journey to Jerusalem. Watch what happens. Prostitutes and con men and gang members. His friends just cut across his path all the time, and he's constantly turning away from the crowds, Yes, he had a ministry and a vision for the masses, but pouring his lives into the ones and twos. I mean, talk about love costing dearly. Love cost Jesus everything, didn't it? Cost him his life. He gave up his life on a cross. He took the punishment that we deserve. That's real love. You know what love looks like? It's a man with his arms stretched out, bleeding and dying because he loved us so much. Paying the price that we deserve. That's what love looks like. And Jesus is the ultimate good Samaritan. And this foreigner, this half-breed, showed the religious people what love really looks like as he poured his life into this broken man. He actually did 10 things, 10 things that I'd love this morning. Maybe we could think about, could we be these kind of people? Because remember, Jesus said, go and do likewise. You've heard this story, now go and do likewise. I'm not just telling you so you can agree with it. I'm telling you so you go and do the same. And the 10 things that Good Samaritan did was firstly, he saw the man. He saw him. You know, you can drive through downtown Eastside and not even see it really. You're just getting on with your life, your busy schedule or wherever it is. You can go about your business. You've got people who are hurting and dying all around you. You don't even see them. Now, I'm a, a Man United fan. I think I mentioned that. And I'm interested how many people are getting into soccer in Canada. About time too, I might say. 
what on earth is hockey? <laughs> but anyway, uh, so, it's not even called soccer, by the way. It's called football. And Manchester United used to be the best team in the world. And it used to be in the good old days, about 10 years ago, and for the previous 20 years, that the, the Premier League was between Manchester United and Arsenal. Annoyingly, now it's between Manchester City and Liverpool. It's like the worst thing for a Manchester United fan. Some of you may think, what is he talking about? <laughs> Other people will be like, I get you. I'm with you, Andy. So stick with me, right? But Arsenal used to have this annoying manager called Arsene Wenger. And he was a Frenchman. And he was famous for at the end of a game when something terrible had happened, when one of his players had like kicked the beautiful Man United centre forward called Wayne Rooney in the thigh and should have been sent off and the referee allowed to get away with it or whatever. Some, or the ball had not gone over the line and they'd given a goal. And, and he'd say, Arsene, what, what happened? Why was Patrick Vieira not sent off or whatever it was? And he would say, I didn't see it. I didn't see it. It's like, yes, you did. But don't you think Christians are like that? We don't even see it. Open our eyes, Lord. Open our eyes to the need. It's the first thing we need to see a world in desperate need. And we've got exactly what they need. The second thing he did was he went to him. No, sorry. The second thing he did was he took pity on him. He had compassion on him. That's good, but it's not enough. It's not enough to see the need and have compassion, feel something in our guts. We've got to three, go to the person and then what did he do? He bandaged his wounds. I believe he tore strips off his own robes to bandage the man's wounds. And then he poured oil, five, and poured wine out. He gave the man the best he had. Seven, he put the man on his own donkey. There's inconvenience for you. He's walking now down this dangerous road and the other guy's got a comfortable ride on his donkey. Eight, he brought him to the inn. Nine, he took care of him. Next level love for a stranger. And how about this? Crazy. I mean, this really spoke to me as I'm reading this familiar story. How many times have I read it? Verse 35, it says, he said to the innkeeper, I'll reimburse you for any extra expense you may have to care for this man. He'd already given the innkeeper two months' money. Two denarii was enough to keep somebody in, a, in an inn for two months to care for him. He said, you look after this guy, whatever it costs, blank check. It wasn't like, here's my tithes to the church, the rest mine. It's like, whatever it takes to love the broken and the neglected and the forgotten and the lost, just whatever it costs, I'm in. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. So Jesus turns to the so-called expert in the law. He wasn't very expert at all in the heart of the law. And he says, which one do you think was his neighbor then? You're asking me who's my neighbor. And the religious man couldn't even say the word Samaritan. He just says, I suppose the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. 2,000 years later, Coastal Church, God's saying, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. Yeah. Go out and find some hurting, broken, lost people and just love on them in Jesus' name. Do whatever it takes. Write a blank check with your life. Here's my life, Lord. How can I help people? And honestly, if you would just pray at the start of every day this week, God, I'm available. Whatever it takes to love people in your name, I'm here. I want to be your hands and feet. I'm going to have my spiritual antennae up as I walk around Vancouver and my workplace, in my home, in my street. I'm going to be looking out for people. And it can be people, maybe they don't look like some of the people in downtown Eastside, just like the good Samaritan, the, the, the guy on the side of the road. Maybe they don't look like him, but inside they're so broken, so hurting. It's a horrible thing to have everything, but have nothing. Perhaps the worst thing in the world is to get everything that's supposed to satisfy and still inside you're lost. So many people in Vancouver in that place, lost on the side of the road, and we've got what they need. How can we keep that to ourselves? And as we have our spiritual antenna up, we will meet people who are thoroughly broken and thoroughly in need, and we can meet the need, and it's the greatest joy in the world. On that video, at the start, we showed the message video. You don't know those people, but I know those people. They're my friends who I work with. On that video is Joe. 
who was a heroin addict for, for year after year after year. He injected his brother with heroin and he died in front of him. His mother and father both died of alcoholism. His best friend died of heroin abuse. And then Joe meets Jesus. And it's been a roller coaster, but he's a phenomenal leader in our ministry. Leads our catering operation and the message, employing lots of ex-offenders. Wow. On the video, Cyril, my friend Cyril, who was hideously abused as a boy, as a child, and a bunch of men went to prison for long stretches because of what they did to that child. And as a result, he was so broken, in and out of prison and addiction. And then he comes to Jesus in, in prison and he's helping to lead our fleet and facilities team and he's on our Eden team in Manchester. What a legend he is. Just an absolutely amazing servant. On the video is Graham. Graham was 32 years in prison, in and out of prison. He's 50 years old, he's on 32 years. And then he meets Jesus. He's, he leads, heads up the work in Neil Street, Covent Garden, our coffee shop there beautiful man of God. He's done the video. He's Dennis, al alcoholic, very violent man in Strange Ways prison. And one of our team goes in just teaching music and teaches him guitar and then starts singing worship songs and the presence of Jesus comes and Dennis gives his life to Christ. And look at them. Oh man, it's been a roller coaster, but you know, I'm like Jesus jumping for joy when I see those things happen. There's nothing like serving God. I believe the Good Samaritan in the story he went down the Jericho Road with a skip in his feet. I've done something good today. My life's counted today. Let us be those people. I'm going to pray for the Christians in a minute. And I just want to pray that we will every day this week have a beautiful encounter with somebody where we can just love on them. And it'll be costly and it'll take time. But wow, what better to do with your life for Jesus? But I'm also going to pray now, right now, for people who don't know Jesus. If you're in the, in the church building today or wherever you are watching online, right now you're going to have a chance to accept this beautiful Jesus into your life and be made right with God, be acceptable to God. When you stand before God, it's as if you've loved him with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. It's as if you've loved your neighbour as yourself. Your sins are forgiven. You're made right with God. Surely you want that. Surely you want a power to live right until you get there. You want your sins forgiven. You want a fresh start. You want to turn away from anything that's not been of him and make him Lord of your life. If you do, I'm going to pray a simple prayer. And honestly, if you pray this prayer in your heart and in your head to God, everything will change. I've seen it like thousands of times over my life. So I'm going to pray it out loud. You pray it with me. Even maybe you're watching on your own, in your kitchen or your bedroom. Just put your hand on your heart and say, God, I mean this. And I'll pray it. Something amazing will happen. You'll be forgiven. You'll be free. You can start blessing people in Jesus' name. Let's pray. You don't know Jesus. Or if you're far, far away from Jesus and you know you've lost the plot, make this your own prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, please come into my life. Forgive every sin and give me a fresh start. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you that you're alive today. Be alive in me, Jesus. And with your help, I'll love people in your name until I see you face to face. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And just one more prayer for the Christians here. Lord, I pray that we won't just hear the word and then go away the same. I pray you'll help us, Lord, this week and from now on every day to be more available we're here for you we choose to allow broken hurting lost people to cut across our plans we choose to invest in that great purpose of blessing the poor and the broken and the hurting and sharing the good news most generous thing we could ever do with people who don't know the good news never heard it in language they can understand let us be those people lord we make ourselves wholly available. Thank you, Jesus.